I'm looking at the history of Halloween in Wales, where it's called Nos Kalangaya, the first night of winter. In Welsh folklore, this is the first and spookiest of the three spirit nights, Ter Nos Sprid Nos, uh, which is when ghosts and spirits would gather at churchyards and styles all over the country. I'm not much of a Welsh speaker, so please excuse my pronunciation. I guarantee it's an absolute embarrassment. Uh, the extent of my Welsh is pretty much like, do not cycle on the footpath and some like light children's book reading. I can also say my hovercraft is full of eels. My Hoffman bad and clown, please be not. So that's useful. There are two major folktale figures associated with Halloween in Wales that I'm going to mention today. The tailless black sow and the headless white lady. In North Wales in particular, where I live, uh, people would celebrate Halloween with big bonfires. And then at the end of the night, when that burned out, they would basically have to run home as quickly as they could, chased by the monstrous black pig. When it comes to women in white, there are tons of stories in Welsh folklore. Uh, some of them make it sound like she's kind of in cahoots with the black sow, so they're like running around together. And then in some of them, she doesn't have a head, so like maybe that's maybe more of a service animal situation. For just one example of a white lady story, I'm looking at South Wales in particular, specifically the Vale of Glamorgan, where she was known as like a restless, wandering spirit. My main source for this is Marie Trevelyan's Folklore and Folk Stories of Wales, which was published in 1909. Um, but if you are interested in Welsh folklore, I also really recommend Mark Rees' podcast, Ghosts and Folklore of Wales. That's got several episodes on lady and white stories, um, and he also often uses Trevelyan as a source. This particular lady wen once guarded the treasure of Moor Castle, where she was one time approached by a brave man and took him to where the gold was hidden. So when I say guarded, eh, like the first person who asked, presumably, she was like, sure. Take one heart, said the white lady, and leave the remainder for me. He did as he was bidden and replaced the stone. Predictably, he then got greedy and went back for the rest of the treasure later. We all know how stories work. That's not a shock. Just as he was leaving the castle, the white lady appeared and accused him of theft. The white lady then set upon him, and to his dismay, he found she had claws instead of fingers, and with these she nearly tore him to pieces. He shouted and tried to get out of her grasp, but this he was not able to do until she had badly used him. Soon afterwards, he was taken ill and gradually became worse. Nobody knew what his illness was, and in the course of time he wasted away. Before he died, he confessed to his adventure, and people called his complaint the white lady's revenge. So rather than dress as a giant pig this year, no comments please, I am going to make an outfit inspired by a white lady. I thought that a fun thing to do would be to look at traditional Welsh national costume as a starting point for that, and then try to recreate that in all white for an historical Welsh ghost. The first thing you'll notice about Welsh national dress is that it is essentially just 18th century peasant wear. Sorry Wales, no offence. Ken Etheridge writes, Many of the individual traits of costume and materials were retained long after they died out in the rest of Britain, but it must not be forgotten that the costume is really the common dress of the peasant, the farm servants and cottagers of bygone days. However picturesque they may appear to us today, many of these costumes were made for hard wear. So, Presumably not in white, but disregard that. Obviously, there would be different fashions and variations depending on the particular area. So in 1796, Yolo Morganic writes very scathingly of the Glamorgan hair-brained wenches who were occupied with the follies of fashion and is a big fan of the Carmarthenshire women who wear the more old-fashioned whittles or like fringed shawls. Men have literally always been this way. But essentially, these are the distinctive features of the Welsh national costume as we recognise it today. The ankle length pice, or petticoat, which was usually made of flannel and often had vertical stripes. The bedgown, or bedgown. I feel like this is the most distinctive top layer. Various places wore shorter jackets as the 18th century went on. I quite like the longer style. Um, this is long and full. It's got pleats at the back similar to a riding habit, which is what it's probably based on. Um, and the long tails can also be pinned back to keep them out of the way. Also, apparently detachable lower sleeves were very common. Big fan. Very commonly in any 18th century dress, you would have a little fichu, which is like a little lace handkerchief that you would kind of tuck in your cleavage to keep yourself decent. I don't think I'm saying that right, but then I don't think I'm saying anything right, so... <laughs> the shawl. This could be a small turnover folded into a triangle, which was seen in Clonelli, Cardiff and Tenby. Or it could be a fringed whittle, common in South Wales. It could be like a nursing shawl, 
designed to hold babies to the chest. Like we all love a shawl. Um, I'm probably not gonna bother with one unless I get chilly. The apron. Fun fact, we have records of servants in the early 19th century being part paid in aprons, which is kind of hilarious, but also pay your workers. The Welsh hat. These basically look like super tall, like sloped top hats. I'm going to disappoint you from the outset here and say that I don't have a traditional wealth hat and I do not intend to try and make one. <laughs> so in my version of this costume, she's going to be headless out of laziness. But actually, Etheridge reassures me that it was by no means universally worn. It was a fashion most prevalent in the larger towns such as Cardiff, Bangor, and Carmarthen. Apparently, straw hats were popular in North Wales. Whatever you wore, there would probably be a little lace bonnet or a mob cap underneath. You might then wear a hooded woolen cape, because Wales is not known for its tropical climate. And then probably stockings and clogs on your feet. I say probably because apparently um, shoes were pretty optional among the lower classes. The Welsh girls of the lower order commonly go without shoes and stockings, but one would not expect to see a wench walking along a flinty road with her shoes in her hand. We could not but admire such economy. So my costume is going to look more or less like this. As you can tell, I'm not getting super into all the regional variations to do with collar shape and specific fabric and colours because if I did, I would end up with a dissertation, but no actual costume. Small interval to think about knickers. Absolutely none of the sources I've looked at in Welsh national dress even mention underwear, not being funny. When this look originates, it's the 18th century, so there is definitely something going on under there, but it's also a poor rural area, so it's probably not full stays for everyone all the time. Especially considering that the Welsh were apparently so poor they couldn't even afford chemises. Not sure I believe that, pinch of salt, they didn't really say where they got that information from, so... Mm. It could be that there are quilted jumps worn underneath the bedgown. This would make sense to me as like an additional warm layer. Or it could be that there is no support system whatsoever, which doesn't really make sense to me as a person with boobs. With that said, the idea of Welsh national dress as we consider it today only really became a thing as we tip into the 19th century. So if you look at a lot of old photographs, those are Victorian era and people are wearing corsets underneath. I've tried my outfit with and without, I wasn't originally going to wear a corset with this, but it does look better. So I'm going with that and we're just going to really hand wave what actual period it is. The petticoat is the easiest part to start with because a petticoat is a petticoat. I've got a massive rectangle of white flannel. I'm using three meters for this petticoat, which I decided using the very scientific method of there was three meters of white flannel left in the fabric shop. Most of the ones I've looked at don't use anywhere near this much fabric, but I like to twirl. I'm doing a little double hem about 10 inches down on the side where the opening is going to be, and then this whole thing is just getting gathered down. I'm doing this by putting my sewing machine on the longest stitch it does and leaving the tails loose, and then I can just pull on one end to turn that into a little drawstring and it helps me distribute my gathers nice and evenly. I've cut a strip for the waistband and everything is getting gathered down to my waist measurement to fit that. I can then just fold over the waistband to sandwich the gathers inside it and top stitch over that. And then I'm adding a little hook and bar attachment and that's the petticoat basically done. I've hemmed it by hand and then I've also sewn in a little pleat a few inches from the bottom, which is very common to see and breaks up the big expanse of white a little. I do have a bunch of examples that I found online, but the thing about most of them is that they're licensed in a way that I can't use them for a video without paying a fortune. So. Trust me. The bedgown is the main event. There are lots of variations in 18th century undress, aka casual wear. There are jackets in Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion 1 that look very similar, but the Welsh bedgowns are quite a lot simpler, which is actually quite frustrating when you love drama as much as I do. This is the garment I'm modelling my costume after most closely. There's not an exact date available for this bedgown, but it's listed as around turn of the century, sort of 1800. Not gonna lie, I'm mostly winging this. It's just for fun. I'm drafting something that looks more or less like a bedgown, and that's just how it's gonna be. So here's how my mock-up looks. I'm 
not gonna lie, I don't feel great about the fabric I've got for this. I really wanted wool or like a wool blend anyway and there was absolutely nothing to be found. So I went with this because it was the only thing thick enough to feel jackety, but it's more like canvas. Um, and also at a glance, I don't think the texture looks different enough from the flannel. It's not really bringing much to the table. Never mind because it's all I've got. I'm assembling the back pieces first, then the shoulder seams, sleeves, and up the side to close it. And the same with the lining fabric. Then I'm just going to press the bodice pieces right sides together and join them all along the top edge. So when they're flipped, it looks nice and neat, in theory if not in practice. Time to discuss the inevitable fit issues. So this is just pin closed at the moment, but I think the bodice generally is looking okay. The issue I have is with the sleeves. Um, you can see they're really, well, they're quite big, but also just very bulky because of this fabric. Um, and while I could get away with that in the mock-up with just a light flannel, it's really obvious in this and it's very annoying. I think if I did want to go back and fix this, the issue is probably where these seams are. Um, but I don't want to go back that far and fix it. <laughs> so that's something I changed to make for next time. It, it's annoying me, but not enough to go back right now, like for this project. Okay, so I thought that I could deal with the not optimum fit of the bed gown pattern. Turned out that I could not because I found myself staying up until 1am last night accidentally, um, repatterning the entire bodice. Was it like the smartest decision I've ever made? No. Am I now sleep deprived? Yes. But the bodice looks a ton better, so you tell me if it was a good thing to do. I kind of used a combination of the existing pattern that I drafted for this and some older ones that I've done in the past that fitted a little bit better. So the main difference that I made was I moved the armhole up higher so it fit closer to the underarm. I think that really helped. Um, and I also did a two-part sleeve, which is what I did for the Lizzie Borden dress and at the time I stressed that it was a pain in the arse and I didn't enjoy doing it that way. However, unfortunately it does look better um, and it is more historically accurate um, because we didn't really use to cut sleeves on the fold, but I really hoped I could get away with it and I couldn't. You know, it's still not perfectly done, there's still stuff to critique where I didn't set them in super evenly. But for the most part, it looks a lot smoother on. And even just at a glance, it kind of looks more like the museum piece. So whether or not it was worth it for a Halloween costume that's gonna get worn once is debatable, but I do feel better about it. So this is a lot better. There's a lot less excess fabric, um, and it certainly looks better around the back of the arm. It's still not ideal, but um, I don't have great sleeve skills, so that's the reason for that. This one is a little bit worse and that's because I didn't fit it in probably at quite the right places so it's kind of twisting but um, it's still significantly better. The bar was low. I'll take it. The closure for this would historically be pins in the front of the jacket. I hate closing things with pins. There's a reason we evolved past that so uh, instead this one uses tapes to tie at the front and I'm kind of taking that as an inspiration but zhuzhing it up and using ribbon instead. It's not the most practical thing in the world and unfortunately it fully does make the fit look even worse. <laughs> Why am I doing this? It's so frustrating. Basically my instinct is always to include boning in 18th century clothing. Um, I'm trying to resist it because if they couldn't afford underwear they could not afford boning. Well and technically without underwear you could do more boning. This is what I've decided to go with for the skirts. There's the big box pleats on the back, but otherwise it's pretty flat by historical costuming standards. And then hemming and attaching the skirts. I'm gonna finish the bottom inside edge of the lining by hand, and I think that's fine. I'm covering two metal buttons in the fashion fabric, and those are going at the lower back. And then I'm putting little buttonholes in the front corners of the skirts and it's gonna just, see that, look at, look at this, look how cute as hell this is.
Easiest feature in the world. I'm just shoving a scrap of white lace in there. And finally, my apron. This is a rectangle hemmed on three sides, and then the top edge is being sandwiched in a sort of folded over waistband strip that will become the ties. Super quick. And we're done. I've been pretty conflicted about whether I should leave this outfit like pure and white and ethereal um, or whether I should like age it and stain it to make it look really dirty and creepy. So I did do a poll on Instagram stories and the consensus was ruin it. That said I was withholding information there so as not to like spoil what the project actually was so like what those voters didn't know was that this does have white in the name so I don't want to overdo it. I also don't want to stain the petticoat in particular so badly that I can't get it clean later, just because like a white flannel petticoat is such a useful layer for future costumes. However, I do need to stop being a big baby and start ruining this outfit. So this is my giant tea bucket. Basically I put in all like the old loose leaf teas that I had in the cupboard that haven't been drunk for ages, um, out, and I've made like a monstrosity. The main thing to think about when aging clothes is you know, what part of the outfit sees the most action and gets the most wear. I'm assuming that the lady wearing spends her time, like me, like tromping through forests and bogs. So immediately I'm dipping the petticoat to make a sort of stained waterline along the bottom hem. I'll do the same with the tails of the Batgoon since they're flapping around and probably getting grubby um, and I think my cuffs also. The ribbons would probably get pretty ratty pretty fast. And the aprons taking the brunt of everything, including when I tear a man to death for stealing my gold and then presumably have to wipe off my claw hams afterwards. My opinion of this piece as I was working on it was just a roller coaster. Um, it definitely pushed me to be like, oh, I need to develop my pattern drafting skills. But when it comes to the outcome and the sewing execution, I'm really pleased with it. I'm really happy with the pictures. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased I did go back and redraft the Bet Goon bodice a second time because I just, I think that was really worthwhile. Like, obviously, it wasn't worthwhile, but it was worthwhile. Like nothing I do is actually worthwhile. If you enjoyed this and would like to support me in my unworthwhile pursuits, please like, subscribe, share with a friend. Just generally help me feel less weird about putting so much work into an incredibly specific project for no reason. And otherwise, happy Halloween. <laughs>